I was what we used to call a latchkey kid. That means I came from a single parent household. My mom worked a lot. That left me home alone quite a bit. That plus the rise of HBO and a video cassette recorder meant that I discovered a lot of, well, crappy entertainment. So to prove to the men in her life she had a mind, Terry decided to try life as a guy. How do I look? Dashy. My zipper's open. That was the dashy part. Now, collectively, any word that doesn't appear in the dictionary is known as a sniglet. See? It pays to know the ghouls of the road. <laughs> Back then it was just TV. With boobs. What I didn't know at the time was the rise of the VCR and HBO created a perfectly overlapped Venn diagram for an entire generation to become steeped in popular culture. You merely adopted the dark. I was born in it. Molded by it. And while I partied with the grapes of generosity and brain games, there was a lot of Porky's Fraternity Vacation, The Hitchhiker, First and Ten, a little miniseries called Glory Years, which no one seems to remember, even though it starred the immortal Tim Thomerson and Tawny Katane. And of course, the holy grail of that stuff will rot your brain, kid. Friday the 13th. Hello? Who's that? Oh, hi. What are you doing out in this mess? One. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you should start your eight-year-old on a steady diet of slasher movies. After all, those movies have violence, intense situations, gratuitous nudity. What I am saying is I have two bachelor's degrees, a master's degree, a successful career, I have a healthy relationship, a handful of friends, no criminal record. Whatever was supposed to happen to me as a result of watching these films didn't happen. Maybe I'm not watching them right. Get a haircut, hmm? The point is that a film doesn't have to be high art to have value. This is the cinematic equivalent of mac and cheese, and lord knows I love me some mac and cheese. But if it doesn't add value to the world from an artistic perspective, then what is the value of Friday the 13th? In 1948, Harold Laswell built off the work of psychologist Abraham Maslow to formulate the framework of a theory that would become known as uses and gratifications theory. Laswell theorized that an audience isn't just a group of passive observers, they are active consumers of a text who pick and choose which media they want to consume in order to satisfy their personal need. After all, if we're consumers of media, then it stands to reason that we consume media to satisfy a need. It's easy enough to recognize that our needs are satisfied by milk and butter, by tampons and toilet paper, by gasoline and air fresheners. It makes sense then that we would also consume media to fulfill a psychological, educational, or emotional need in our lives. Feeling like you might need a sad emotional release? That's what Terms of Endearment, The Notebook, and The Fault in Our Stars are for. Need more of an energetic jumpstart? How about Jurassic Park or Die Hard? Want to bond with your buddies over some pizza and beer? Throw in an Apatow movie and let the quotes flow. No! Kelly Clarkson! Many critics theorize about the usefulness of horror films, but what most agree on is that horror allows the audience to experience a simulacrum of death safely so that we can process our own mortality. As theoretical explanations for consumption go, that's not bad. But let's operationalize it a bit. Laswell and later theorists thought that there were five different reasons that an audience chooses media. Number one, information and education. This will be irrelevant to our discussion for reasons that are obvious. Unless you want to get into practical makeup effects, Friday the 13th probably doesn't have a whole lot to offer you in the way of education. Not even birds and bees stuff. But we will talk about a form of education when we talk about narrative theory. Number two, entertainment. This is probably the primary reason most of us selected this film. If you're anything like me, the real fun of Friday the 13th is the last half hour, where everyone else has been killed off and the cat and mouse game between the killer and the final girl, or boy, commenced. It's like hide and seek if it were a spectator sport. The kills are only there to set the stakes. Number three, personal identity. And this is where we start getting into the most interesting and most controversial uses of media. Katz, Gurovitz, and Haas collated 35 specific needs into essentially the same grouping Laswell named, with the intention of clarifying and categorizing the needs. They, along with many other psychologists and mass media scholars, hypothesized that audience members use film characters to learn and interpret their own behavior. 
After all, most of us do learn behavior from the people around us. We learn manners and communication practices and citizenship. We learn how to be a good or bad student. We learn how to treat our loved ones. All of that is learned behavior. Donald Horton and Richard Wohl coined the term parasocial interaction to refer to a special kind of relationship that a consumer and a celebrity have in which the celebrity, or character in this case, is never aware that the specific audience member exists. But the audience member experiences a relationship that is similar to, and sometimes indistinguishable from, an interpersonal social relationship. Horton and Wall analyze parasocial interaction as a form of deviant or abnormal behavior, but the pervasiveness of mass media over the ensuing 70 years since their initial study has only served to normalize parasocial interaction and bake it into the culture as a primary, if not the primary, mode of relationship. It feels like every time we do this, I never have good food. I've been killing it lately, you kidding me? <laughs> This is a part of our Plant rice bowl that we got. I heard it's okra. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section. And if you're one of those people who's arching a judgmental eyebrow right now at those losers who can't distinguish fiction from reality, that's not the point. The point is, we all use fictional relationships because they offer control that real relationships don't. What, you've never had a sexual fantasy about a celebrity? Hornhub says you probably have. And this includes everything from teenage girls learning what society thinks their body should look like to young boys learning what women and other men expect from them. It says you're a dead f What? A dead f Of course, many lay people and soundbite addicts take this to mean that film, television, and video games are responsible for mass shootings, which is not at all what the theory says. However, what the theory does say is that people who are already prone to violence will likely seek out media that justifies their behavior. Look at it this way, if media didn't influence us, Super Bowl ads would go for $1.75 per second instead of $175,000 per second. Number four, escapism. Being able to displace yourself into a narrative offers a temporary respite from emotionally disturbing events in real life. It's why teenagers dive into nonstop gaming. It's why adults bury themselves in work rather than deal with grief and trauma. It's why people of all stripes escape their feelings through drinking, drugs, and even sex. Escapism taken to the extreme can be paralyzing, but as philosopher John Longaway puts it, the function of escapism is to compensate for irrational patterns of belief formation and to maintain effectiveness in situations in which a rational person would succumb to despair and suicide. So for Longaway, escapism isn't just disappearing into another world for a few hours, it's disappearing and finding ways to process what's going on in the real world, even if that process is through self-deception. For Friday the 13th fans, the reasons for escaping included everything from nuclear brinksmanship to a rapid explosion in economic inequality to an inability to deal with the conservative social hierarchies and sexual politics of high school. I won't tolerate any losers in this family. Your intensity is for Win! 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 You son of a bitch. Number five, social identity or fandom. This one is actually perfect for YouTube because an abstract idea has become concrete through the advance of technology. In 1983, political scientist Benedict Anderson wrote that people will form nations based upon a perceived similarity with others and a sense of belonging to that group. And if I were to take you back to my personal story that opened this video, you'd see that my experience as a fan of the genre was somewhat isolating in terms of my actual social peer group. It wasn't until college that I found a group of friends who shared the same interests as me and somewhat validated my fandom. But if you're a fan of anything pop culture related, whether it's slasher movies, anime, or superheroes, you probably have a similar experience of searching for your people. And mass media is a way to make that happen. Of course, social interactions have two sides. And upon striking up a conversation with a fellow Halloween fan, I was told not to compare my fandom to his because he had an autograph poster, an authentic replica mask, and every iteration from VHS to Laserdisc to DVD of the original film. And the only thing I could say was, hold on there, Haas, I'm just saying I like the movie. But that's the thing with imagined communities and participatory culture. Once we have the boundary set for who is and isn't a fan, we start to jockey for who is the best fan. There's a fair amount of social capital that comes from being able to interact with the text on the highest level. It translates to likes and shares and subscribes, which then in turn translates to actual capital. That's why it's so important to see a film on opening night, to buy all the merchandise, to know all the trivia, because immersing yourself in a text elevates you in the fan community. Doctors Christopher Bell and Lauren Camachi have an excellent breakdown of this in the Deconstruction Workers podcast, link in the description. But let's say someone shows up at my party and they are wearing a vintage Steve Atwater Super Bowl jersey to my party. That's an invitation for the lore master 
to come up to them and institute the quiz. Of course, major corporations recognize this, and they employ strategies to take advantage of your closely held identities. He's headed for the video championship. <laughs> this guy? What is that? Power Glove. Jason should have been watched every minute. He was... He wasn't a very good swimmer. His unique ability to regenerate lost and damaged tissue, I mean, it just it cries out for more research. As fandom scholar Henry Jenkins notes, fanfiction is a way of the culture repairing the damage done in a system where contemporary myths are owned by corporations instead of owned by folk. In a world where the franchise has bounced from Paramount to New Line to Platinum Dunes and back again, and legal battles prevent future films from being made, it becomes more important than ever for fans to reclaim the franchise through fan art, fan fiction, fan films, even gaming. And finally, I would be remiss in not mentioning that for a not insignificant part of the population, Friday the 13th films functioned as a sort of softcore pornography. This may come as a shock to you if you were born after 1995 and have had virtually unfettered access to pornography in your pocket, but there was a time when, if you wanted to see naked women or impossibly attractive people having sex, you had to actually go out and find it through a humiliating process of buying magazines or accidentally wandering into the back of the video store. The Friday the 13th series was relatively tame in terms of sex and nudity, with one notable exception. But if you were born anywhere from 1970 to 1977, any port in a storm would do. The bottom line is whether you're using the Friday the 13th series to escape the horrors of your everyday life, to bond with other members of the fandom community, or to ogle Kirsten Baker in tight jean shorts. You're not just a passive observer. You select the franchise because you're getting something out of it. And that's important to examine. Hey Friday fans and scholars, thanks for sticking with this project. If you want more horror, check out my Horror 2 playlist, where I look at all sorts of different horror films, literature, and television. And as always, check out the Deconstruction Workers podcast for your academic pop culture fix. I'll be back in a few weeks for part four, and until then, keep track of that corkscrew.